The Spin-Off Podcast Network. This is Kiwi is back for a brand new season with more inspiring kōrero from special guests including rugby player, father and role model TJ Peronara. My family bring me joy. Rugby brings me joy too, but it's not the same joy as my family brings me. And global dancer and choreographer Kirsten Dodgen. For some reason people think I'm very intimidating. Listen to the new season of This Is Kiwi, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in collaboration with Kiwi Bank. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBank. Hi, I'm Brian Crump, host of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact, a new RNZ podcast in which we take some of science fiction's strangest ideas and explore if they could really happen. Maybe they already have. You can find Sci-Fi Sci-Fact on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, basically anywhere you get your podcasts from. Kia ora, Jane here, host of The Real Pod. One of the hosts of The Real Pod. The other two are here in spirit. I'm also just here in spirit. This is pre-recorded. We're on holiday. Uh, But we are replaying some of our favourite episodes of 2021 just to keep your feed nice and busy. And we will be back next week, I believe. We'll be back in your ears. But in the meantime, this, this has got to be the pinnacle of the real pod, I think, for 2021. It was the uh, Celebrity Treasure Island final recap, hosted by myself and Duncan. But also, we had... Chris Parker, winner of CTI, join us in the studio. And it was a truly emotional kōrero. There were tears. They were flowing. And it was a really special interview. And it wasn't just an interview, though. Like, it was really, I don't know. It was a moment. It was a moment. I think you'll agree. Enjoy this. Can't wait to talk to you guys again next week. Hope you've had an amazing summer so far. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm sorry. My voice is breaking. I'm emotional. I have shed tears. We have reached the conclusion of Celebrity Treasure Island 2021. And I have every feeling imaginable. What kind of monster wouldn't be shedding tears? I feel like you should be sort of tagged for state surveillance if oh. you weren't like all, all in your feelings at the end of that. Anyone who has not watched this season. I just feel pity for you because you have missed out on something so special. First of all, huge congratulations to winner Chris Parker. And and extremely exciting news, he is going to be joining us uh, a little bit later on in the podcast for a week, Chinwag. It's amazing. It's amazing. I, I, I didn't even allow myself to imagine him as the winner because it... It didn't feel like it was set up that way. And so I was, and then, you know, as we'll discuss, the finale doesn't exactly, it's not <laughs> like he cruised there. It wasn't a walk for him. So it really was just the, the, the way that it snuck up on you. Just perfect, perfect end to a perfect season. Really was. Okay, so I should introduce the show. So welcome along to The Real Pod's Real Recap of Celebrity Treasure Island. This is our final episode for this season. Uh, my name's Jane Yee. I'm joined by Duncan Grieve. We've also got T.I. Hare Butler in the producer's, uh, producer's seat, and he has been watching along, so you, we may hear from him throughout the episode. Um, so how this is going to roll is, as I mentioned, Chris will be joining us later, and we're going to try and hold it together in the meantime to kind of recap the main beats of this week. I know it's all over, and you've, you have you know the result, and you're fresh from the finale, but um, but there are a couple of things that we don't we, we don't want to skim over. We want to make sure that we cover off because they are important elements of the show. We've they're been they're bits of the final week, which was which was fascinating in its own right. But I think they're also like, you know, without getting too to prefold on it. Um, it's my other media podcasts, like and subscribe, etc. Like there are some big things about the the show which uh, I'm actually going to write about for the spinoff coming on Friday 
that that are, that are like kind of significant beyond the show itself. I feel like like this will be remembered this season in a number of ways. Okay, before we get our CTI nerd on, just have to say a big thank you to Nando's who are back on board as sponsors of the Real Pod. Thank you, Nando's. Make sure you download their app. Well, you can you can place your takeaway orders through. I think they've got their own delivery service imminently and. Uh, yeah, no disrespect to the many fine intermediaries out there in the global economy, but you want every dollar going to Nando, right? Yes, yes. Because also, let's bear in mind, Nando do a lot of good things out in the community. But yeah, particularly in uh, in Africa, like there are there are a lot of, of mosquito nets that have been distributed. There are a lot of good jobs that have been made. So and locally, they do they've been doing cans for chips. They've been uh, you know supporting the the city mission, the Auckland city mission. So you know worldwide, global, go Nando's. Thank so you very much. It's a lifestyle. It's a movement. <laughs> okay, so Monday nights, yep, this is where uh, we had Lance in power once again, a, a position he's been very comfortable with throughout this whole season. Drunk that, on power. Drunk on power, except for that one moment where he, he didn't want to be powerful anymore. But I think that was almost a, a, a sort of a perfect exemplar of just how powerful he was. He was like, I'm bored <laughs> of just <laughs> exactly. all this power. <laughs> Um, we started off, before he got to pick the duos, we started off with this little weird interview situation, a kind of an Oprah-esque sit-down. It was like, it was like after, the, after the final treasure, but before the final yeah. treasure? And I was kind of like, oh, this is going to be, this is filler, right? I was like, this is clearly filler. We've not got as much stuff going on now. But it was actually bloody heartwarming. It was. It Buck? Was Buck. Buck and his shouting out to the rainbow community and just, I, Buck, I mean, man, for someone who was barely on screen for most of this season, really came into his own in those last few eps. There, 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 were, there were quite a few characters, I mean, characters, Candy and, and Edna too, uh, who were sort of somewhere between, on a spectrum between not existing at all and villains out the first half. And everyone came home with a real, like, emotional load. It was beautiful. Something's turned, though, on Candy. Edna, on her Insta stories this week, revealed that Candy rifled through her personal belongings and read a clue. Wow. And then I think shared that clue around. I love that, though. I mean, that, but that's, like, going through someone's personal stuff, that's next level. I mean, is it? Yes, is it? If yes. you, if you, if your person, I mean, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, okay, it is, it is. Because otherwise, but, you're forced to hide your clue in a body cavity. You which know? I think, <laughs> if you, if you're trying to beat Lance, you should be considering that. <laughs> and I think if we just, with the, with the, uh, with the benefit of now knowing how useful the clues were <laughs> in the final, it probably meant nothing. It's completely meant completely, nothing. Completely, but we'll get to that. I, it's, it's just so amazing to me how much strategic play. Was involved in clues and getting the getting and exchanging of clues and all that kind of stuff when they were not even worth the paper they were written on. <laughs> it's it's so funny because eh? it, it, they were so yeah the, the whole show really is about um, getting and sharing clues and absolutely by the end you're like oh doesn't matter make the final you got a shot <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the other big thing that came out, it was actually not this week, it came at the end of last week, we forgot to mention it in last week's pod, is that Candy is Buck's cousin-in-law. Buck is married to Candy's cousin. Maybe Candy and Buck were both trying to get out of moving, helping with the moving of the house. True, <laughs> true. <laughs> the team effort. I loved Candy and Buck's relationship. There are so many iconic duos out of this that, that you want to see like a, a spin-off, you'll pardon the pun, just... just like a little half hour kind of where are they now? Like, yeah. Like basically I want to know because the, these friendships, like there's no way that the, the, the sort of emotional bonds that were forged in this that we saw sort of just pouring out of everyone at the end, there's no way those are fake. What I really want to, I would love to see a sort of three months time, six months time, how many of those have just sort of fallen away and mm. were a product of the moment versus like Lance and Chris looks like a lifelong friendship. It's to a me. lifelong friendship. I feel like I, you know, it, it's still going strong. Yeah, I believe there have been backyard picnics in level three. Well, stage we'll find out one. soon. We will we'll find, find out, out soon. soon. Uh, I agree, and I think that while we have a lot of documentaries and so on, that um, we'll give you a recap at the end and give you kind of a satisfactory roundup of where people are at now um, after filming. I think they need to start employing this for shows like Celebrity Treasure Island, where we got very invested in the relationships. And the final shots were great, them all rolling around in the treasure, but how good would it have been if the closing credits had, like, updates of 
Lance and Chris picnicking in the backyard. And, you know. What have you seen, uh, like, at the end of uh, Line of Duty, one of my favourite things about that incredibly silly, incredibly fun show, which is, you know, the, the sort of English anti-corruption police procedural for the three people on, in New Zealand who haven't seen it, <laughs> is um, the, the way that at the end of the season they kind of go into the future and tell you what happened to all the characters. And you're like, these are made-up characters. <laughs> you, the show ended when it did. Like you, you, you got a bit more story making up still to do. Did they just think they were they were like we were told right at the end they weren't getting another season? They're like we just need to flesh. But out. every time, I mean, they were always going to get another season. That's the most successful show in history. It's just hang very... on. Are they? Oh, this is going off. We're going off pace. Uh, anyway, I, I, we so... are Chris Parker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're a long, long Wish way from home in the right reeds. now. <laughs> but, um, but I think that the other thing they could do, I'm just here. Here's some free ideas, Warner Brothers. These aren't copyright the spinoff. Is uh, you know, like as a as a promo for the next season, you could just you know, like have a a little after the final rose that that iconic group a year on. You know, that's not going to cost a lot. Everyone wants to get together and talk about it. Like. I want to know everything. I want to get back there somehow. I'm scared, though, because so often I'm, I'm, I'm so in on a show and then as soon as it's off air, within a week I've forgotten everything about it. I'm hoping this is the one that's different. This one and The Apprentice Aotearoa are yeah. different. Um, this is just not... I look back and think the final three in Celebrity Treasure Island the last season, you had The Wiz. I mean, great concept. <laughs> Sam Wallace... And who's the other one? No one knows the other one. Shane Cameron. Shane Cameron. Is it? Okay. It's just like I didn't, uh, bless them all, didn't care about a single one of them. Like <laughs> Three muscly boys. <laughs> like Sam Wallace completely turned into a maniac, which was all that kept me watching. That was And I really, I did enjoy that season, but I loved the final three in this season so much. But this season felt like a, like a landmark in the sense that uh, the, the, the sort of Diversity of the casting across any metric you care to name was was really fascinating. The amount of te reo used mm-hmm. and the way that they um, sort of acknowledged Nati Kuri and uh, the, the the sort of sensitivity with which it was made versus how reality TV that's not normal <laughs> not normally what you're watching it for that felt huge. Like I I think after the season you could make quite a compelling argument for a public funding of this show because it accomplishes so many of the New Zealand On Air goals in a way that it previously didn't even try, much more so than a lot of funded shows, if I'm honest. I agree with you. Um, what I'd like to talk about is the two signature failings, which I'm really curious about. Okay, So the last two eliminations were very one note mm-hmm. in the sense that the only skill for the the the, uh, the elimination that saw Jess and Candy go was carrying a heavy thing over an easy to balance thing and just just pouring it mm. on. So strength was just an enormous advantage uh-huh. there. Buck Buck won it, and then when Buck went home against Edna, you had like a tiny person who's honestly, if you were designing someone to who can cling to a pole for basically forever, that's Edna, mm. you know. And if you to design it someone like a human body that won't be able to do it, it's Buck. He's a big former all black forward. He's also in his 60s. So both of those were kind of non-events. And what I'm curious about is like, do you think that was just luck of the draw or that that was producers engineering the finale they wanted? I would imagine that I think it has to be luck of the draw. The final challenge is always an endurance challenge. That's just part of the show, part of the format. The um, I can't imagine that they that they are able to make the equipment required to see the result that they want. Do you well, know what I mean? Well, no, no, I don't because I think they've clearly got like dozens of random weird things <laughs> to make people do, and to have like a sort of an a, array of a few different ones and then be able to say, okay, this is what we need to to, ah. to give the the highest likelihood. Of, of our desired outcome. I mean, I don't want to be too Machiavellian about it, but obviously, like, 
producers play a role in this thing, that would be quite an easy way to put a thumb on the scale, so to speak. Maybe, perhaps, yes. I mean, certainly they didn't do that last season when we ended up with a very bizarre final <laughs> three. Three identical blokes, essentially. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's entirely possible. We did end up with a, just a crazy, charismatic final three. Um, it was just, you know, all had journeys and stories throughout their time on the island and been great television. So, you know, maybe... Maybe. What was your second thing? That was your first thing. Your second question? Forgotten it? No. Let's get into the television show. <laughs> okay. Lance chats with everyone about what they, who they do and don't want to be paired up with and cons Jess out of a clue in the negotiations. He's a shark. He's a shark. Didn't need the clue in the end. Um, and then he reveals his plan and Jess is pissed. No, Jess is sad. Is she pissed? She's pissed. She's pissed and she's, sad. She's pissed and sad. And she, we've never seen her um, effect like this. Like, it feels like it fundamentally impacts her view of Lance and her view of the world, to be honest. Yeah. So I think she saw it as um, a, a personal kind of attack, which Lance explained it certainly wasn't. It was strategic, which anyone watching would know. But I think Jess is such a nice person that she would never do that to someone else and can't imagine why he would do that. I can't believe they took him at his word. And he was like, yeah, I'll pair Jess and Edna up. That's never going to happen. Lance is a genius. Yeah, but I think, like, it's quite an intense thing because he's a very personable guy. And, you know, I think that they were taking him at face value and then suddenly this, you know, like, it it was quite duplicitous even for Lance to do that. Ah, Totally, but he had to do it, and I think uh, he made the right call. Jess, unfortunately, the the uh, the collateral damage was Candy's self esteem, surely, <laughs> because Jess was so mortified that she'd been paired with Candy, and that the whole last three weeks were a complete waste of time. Or, or, or was she, you know, or was she, could she dress that up as being mortified at being betrayed? You, I think she tried to dress it up as that, but she also, in, her, in the moments, was like, now I'm going to lose. Like, now yeah. I don't have a shot. Like, this yeah. has all been a waste of time. <laughs> so if not in the moment, Candy certainly would be watching that back going, oh. But then again, Candy's rifling through Edna's personal belongings, so all fear and, and <laughs> treasure and sand, um, <laughs> as the saying goes. Uh, Edna and Buck appeared together. This is cute. It's it's. This didn't, whole, it this, didn't feel cute at the moment, but if this hadn't happened, we wouldn't have got the amazing uh, little end to the story that we did. It was a great little kind of B plot line for the final week was these two people who really had quite undisguised uh, enmity towards each other being thrown together. And, you know, I just, I really loved the way that their characters kind of unpeeled and, and revealed themselves towards the end. Mm. And and, uh, and I think... You know, as as we said before, with Buck talking about uh, the Ramo community and his Fano, the, there's something about the 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 kind of vision of what a you know a, a bluff old all black captain can be in a modern context mm. that feels like kind of revolutionary, yeah. low key. And also, I think that the the um, what did they call him? The ox and the fox. Buck and Buck and Edna had this kind of fake it till you make it thing going from the moment they appear together they're like yeah Kia ora koutou te here. here um, Jane has to step out for a moment to take a phone call she does come back soon in the meantime here's me and Dunk was it not Candy and Buck who had the gave them the big telling off for being duplicitous and putting Candy up last minute yes and then it was her who was rif- do you think that was she was rifling after that I think that, yes, basically my, my working theory based on only having been told it about 10 minutes ago <laughs> is that Candy very belatedly realised that there was a game and then she was trying to figure out, oh, how do I play this? Ah, right. And she went too far. Yeah. Whereas if you kind of came into it with a sort of working knowledge of what games in this context are like and, mm-hmm. and here are what the rules are, you'd know that that's not the one. You know, you betray people all the time, but sure. you, you know, there are these boundaries. And she was like, I guess this is okay. Clearly it was like without any awareness of what makes for good television. And then, yeah, what the defined lines of political um, deviance. Yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, and foolishly, she 
She didn't just search through anyone's life. She'd search through <laughs> Buck's belongings. All good. Buck's not going to go live yeah. and error her out. Yeah. Unfortunately, she went through this. To the like really who was going to be the most outspoken about it. Precisely. After the, after the fact. Precisely. Yeah. Edna really, Edna really did a 180 in my, my opinion. I just could not stand her at the start of the series. So much. Be- because of the way they dressed her up to be so antagonistic. But I wonder, like... I don't think that that was, I could be wrong, I don't think that that was a pure production decision to frame her that way. My my theory of it is that she was very tightly wound. She didn't give a lot of herself. She's mm. used to operating around people who are, broadly speaking, like her. So to be around all these different personalities, away from all the kind of things she normally leans on, she just took a while to unclench and let herself be and let a sort of maybe an inner Edna out. This yeah. is very charitable reading, but it, it feels like the the performance bears it out. No, that scans, and, and it also feels like it kind of aligns with the timing of it and the timing of the endurance challenge against Richie, where she came back devastated and sort of actually broke and opened up about the fact that she was disappointed in herself, not only because of her own failing, but because of the fact she didn't bring home the bacon for the team, which was like finally letting them in and finally letting them see that she's actually quite a cool person. Yeah, I think I think that's, that's dead right. That is the sort of year zero of the... Or the rebirth of Edna, because <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny eh? because because like the gap between, I mean, I don't I don't follow her on social and I only watch a little bit of Boss Babes, but my sense is that the Edna that we saw around the start of the show was very much the Edna that she puts out into the world, mm. and it's to the show's credit that there was just no nowhere to hide, and and it obviously had the you know number of people, not least Chris, had yeah. revelations about themselves on the show, and I think Edna is one of them. Um, same with Buck. Like that, that's basically why I was charming. The games, sort of, who cares? But it was the fact that they were in this alien environment, genuinely discovering things about one another that made it such a revelation. Ostensibly for a charitable cause as well, which is like the icing on the cake of it all is that Chris the entire time was trumpeting the cause for Rainbow Youth. Yeah. I I mean, I was honestly right the way through somewhat cynical about the charitable cause thing. Like they they were all, obviously, they all had very genuine reasons to want things for the charity, but it seemed like something that you figure out right at the end rather than the whole raison d'etre of the show. But Chris, the... You could tell that when he was like just hopelessly behind, hopelessly lost, you know, there's that that great line he had about, um, you know, his perseverance. That was the the thing that he went, the well that he went back to. And that was basically a cipher for his own sort of teenage self, mm. you know, him having to go back to the to, and, and just wanting to be able to from his current position of fame and confidence to go back and take that sort of small frightened um, kid oh, in, in Christchurch and, and uh, you know rescue him Hi, I'm Brian Crump, host of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact, a new RNZ podcast in which we take some of science fiction's strangest ideas and explore if they could really happen With the help of scientists from New Zealand's McDiamond Institute, we'll look at all your favourite science fiction characters, from Wolverine to Rumpelstiltskin, Doctor Who to Luke Skywalker. You can find Sci-Fi Sci-Fact on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, basically anywhere you get your podcasts from. When you choose to invest, your money has power. Avoiding companies that finance weapons production or ignore climate change is important. But impact investing goes beyond just avoiding harmful behaviours. It's an opportunity to invest in companies that are actually improving the world. Invest in a better future with the Harbour Sustainable Impact Fund. Grow your wealth and make a positive impact on the world. This is not personalised advice, a disclaimer and the product disclosure statement for Harbour Investment Funds issued by Harbour Asset Management is available at harbourasset.co.nz. Right, we're back. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, right, where are we up to? The uh, There was an Auckland sandwich lunch, which should have been a lovely time. It was a terrible time by all accounts uh, because everyone was dark. Not everyone. Chris They're wasn't, Chris wasn't They're dark. They're brooding. <laughs> Jess and Edna in particular, very, very dark on Lance. And he really managed to turn them around. I, I mean, I think this is 
quintessential Lance where he plays the game to the fullest, but then when he goes to talk to you, he gives you the real him, the mm. sincerity, and that's why. That's a hard assignment mm. to basically completely screw someone over and then be like, be able to, to pull them back. And I think that's why we all love Lance. Oh, we love Lance. Okay, and then, of course, we know that uh, Jess and Candy went home and the Final Four re- re- relocated to an amazing glamping spot, uh, a simply gorgeous grazing platter, and they're at Spirits Bay, where I have been before. Lovely, lovely, lovely beach. Just amazing. Looked it. Worst case of sea lice I have ever had in my life. How many cases of sea lice have you had in your life? A couple, but usually it's like a little bit under the the tog line kind of thing. This was like, I was there with a friend. She counted hundreds of bites. Ooh. Yeah. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in. Just a bit of real life experience. (laughs) Um, Wrong episode. (laughs) I know. That's confusing. Sorry. Um, Lance has four clues, and this is the moment he reveals to Chris that he got Richie's clue, which Chris suspected all along. Not suspected, knew. He knew. But But he was almost enjoying the fact that Lance was was doing some of his lies on him. It was so cute when Lance said it to camera, and Chris was just like, I knew it. And they had huggy bears, and it was just so lovely. It was just one of the, like, Someone make a supercut of from meeting to the the the, the, the just a bromance supercut yeah. of those two. I yeah. want to see it. They had the set fire to the eel challenge, uh, which Edna and Buck won. Is a weird challenge because how do you qualify when the red bits burnt? You know. I was just happy that that Buck and and Edna won that though. It was it was really uh, great for them, and Edna came out the back of that saying she feels like she has two new brothers and a dad. And as a viewer, I feel the same. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> I feel like I've got a sister and two new brothers and a dad. And can we, you know, when we go to level 3.2, can we all get together for a picnic? I was literally please? messaging uh, <laughs> T- Tina Tiller, beloved Tina Tiller, longtime producer of The Real Pod, the exact same thing this morning. She's been watching it too. Well, it's just something about the nature of the show, plus being in lockdown and missing the kind of easy company mm. of larger groups of people that you don't know all that well. I think it became a cipher for that. So that challenge was for one of the useless clues and then they had an individual challenge but the first pair to complete it would win and it was the balls in the maze type thing and um, this is one where <laughs> we buck take to fall and Shizzo just yells out, oh, fuck. <laughs> And I just leave it, and it's beautifully just left in. <laughs> it's so great, but he's fine, obviously. Chris and Lance, convincing win. Uh, and then Edna's feeling very emotional. She's got the weight of all wahine, the world over, on her shoulders. Um, but very strong lady, so I feel like she can, if anyone can handle it, she can. Yeah. And uh, and then there was a beautiful exchange between Edna and Buck um, where he said, you know, she's got heaps of potential. Her rough edges will be smoothed out in time. And it was just lovely. Just it was, lovely. It was beautiful. And then the, the aforementioned pole, pole hold, yeah. which I, again, I was like, I really want to do that. because I do not. Well, what, what Buck ended up doing with the, the sort of the wraparound koala, I was like, I feel like he should have done a combo of that, like the gripping with the feet, koala at the top, and then sw- just, just sort of switch them a bit more. But, I think um, the switching up is where maybe it becomes, the is where you, you almost want to go rigid in the position that you're in and just stay there and then you just the rest is all just mental tenacity, you know? But the problem is, like like I said, Edna, Edna is Sarah Connor in Terminator, <laughs> you know, like she was just built to do that one specific thing and, and Bucky had no shot. Yeah, I don't think Buck really... Was that worried about winning? He just definitely wasn't hungry for the win of the total competition like everyone else. I mean, in his post-match interview, like he's the top four. Everyone else prior has been like, it's been an amazing experience. I've learned so much about it. He's, he's just like, yeah, it's a bit of fun. Just a game. Just a game. And then uh, he was like, oh, I'm just not very emotional. I was emotional one day and it was when we won the World Cup. I loved that line <laughs> so much. Hey, you know, like. And it didn't feel like he was just talking about after one game. It was just like, at any point in my life. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> There's been one time where I felt something other than just uh, stoic. <laughs> yeah. And it was when we won the World Cup. Uh, anyway, uh, he hands his clues all over to Edna. Again, what's the point? And we get to the final. One more tiny thing. Yes. I loved, loved, loved when uh, Buck was doing his exit interview with Chizzo. And uh, they, they were going on, as they do, about him being the oldest participant ever. And he was like, oh, I'd come back again with, with just the oldies. And I was like, 
The, you great know show. How, I'm, uh, great show. I've been pitching this, you know, my, my uh, last shot at love reality show, which is like said in a rest time. It's a bachelor, but in a rest time. I don't know why no one is doing reality shows with just heaps of old people. Like they're the last ones watching Linear, and I would watch the shit out of it. They were doing, they they were supposed to, they were casting at one point for a US seniors batch. I don't know what happened to that. Like they, they you know, they were taking applications. I want it. I also want um, old celebrity Treasure Island. Yeah. Very chill, very tranquil. Like Buck's the youngest. He's the he's the floor, not the ceiling of age. True. Make it happen. I, I love uh I wanna be on this show, but also I don't ever want to do an endurance challenge and I don't want to have to poo in a cave. But aside from that, I'm I'm in, you know? Well, I mean, what to be fair, we're in the upper half of the demo right now. Maybe yeah. we can be on we old just, celebrity. Just, well, you're you're actually hold, natural and old celebrity. We just uh, have to hold on for just a few more old. years and we're there. <laughs> okay, anyway, Candy had a dream that Chris won. Um, excuse me, clairvoyant. And then he spent eight hours dreaming that he hit the hit the chest with a spade. Um, and that's how that's how he starts off his day, thinking, you know what? I might just bloody win this. I'm not gonna tell you what happens yet. <laughs> they uh, they head off to to the challenges, and this is something very much set up, these three challenges or tasks as they call them, very much set up for physical prowess. I feel like this whole thing was, you know, if, if you were fit and strong, you had the advantage, apart from the, the word unscramble. But even the word unscramble was, it, it wasn't a classic puzzle in the sense no. that like, you could see patterns. It was The advantage it, was if you got there first, right, and had the time. And you also, by then, you'd done two physical challenges and then had a third big run afterwards. Yeah, so yeah. it was very much weighted in favour of, of Lance and Edna. And even like... To be honest, watching Chris do, I was surprised he ever finished the the ball on a placard thing. Lance's ball was oddly sticky. I wonder if there yeah. was like a little flat patch or something. I think if when we talk to Chris, we'll learn about the oh, I, I think know. he talked on our Insta Live about like little divots in the balls and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, how the, the fact that they had to do ITMs in the moment interviews during the challenge is blows my mind. I would refuse. I'd be like... Are you kidding me? I am already half an hour behind those they guys. They were very good ITMs. They very were. good ITMs. So anyway, Chris is just so badly out the back that you he almost is functioning as comic relief at this yeah. point between the real competition. He's he's wildly behind. And then even when he finally makes it to the place, he for some reason just sprints off in the wrong direction. <laughs> They just hear, you hear this kind of guy thrashing through the jungle, yelling like miles away. Chris is not in the final. No, like, no. His self-talk was adorable. His talking to that little ball oh was my adorable. God. And I think it says a lot for like mindfulness and kind of keeping in the moment and keeping calm. It's just like chatting to yourself. He made, he never gave up. Chris, Chris, Chris's self-talk should be like a man, like, like that, that is just... I, I don't know what to say about that. I want to listen. I want to have him on Spotify self-talking <laughs> to me whenever I'm feeling low. It was just so beautiful and so effective. Oh, I mean, that's an absolutely a possible, a possible revenue stream now that he is as big a star as he is going to be at the back of this. Um, okay, they in the shack, as we found out, the clues were useless. You could literally just rifle through things. It's not even like three specific bits of mapping yet. There were like so many opportunities to get the map. It was map for days. And then, uh, th- then they just start digging in the same area. Where, where Lance has already found the area. X without yeah. <laughs> without even needing the map. And there isn't really like it's not like the 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 yeah, you don't need you don't need the map. And the thing is, right from the start you're going, that kind of matted yeah. wild grass. You, there's just no way that they've been up there long enough to, to regrow that. And and Edna even sort of figures that out a bit at the start. But they exhaust themselves on mm. it. And then Chris just comes up and this is the one bit where, like, brain over brawn somewhat. It's just like, I'm just going to find anywhere it could possibly yeah, be. Yeah, anywhere that looks like it might have been dug up in the last 48 hours, you know? And he, oh, that sound, that, when he hits it, and you think, is this real? Like, did they get this finale? Like, imagine if you were production sort of watching this back, just going, no. I think production knew all along. I think that this finale, and it always is made up to be like this, that it doesn't really matter how far behind you get. That last search of the treasure, the map is not very exact. So there's a really good chance that everyone's going to be end up just digging, and it's a game of chance by that point. Anyway. Anyway. Chris, was, Chris won. They rolled around in the money. They all wept. I wept. It was just so beautiful. Lance helped him pull it out. He was so proud of Chris. And Edna had a big grin on her face. And it just, no one seemed disappointed at what happened. You know, no one was bummed out that they didn't win because they had 
been on this journey together. We all have. Let's get him in. Let's get him in. I don't even know how to start this. I'm so jazzed up. I'm so excited. I've been a ball of emotion. Chris Parker, winner of Celebrity Treasure Island 2021. Welcome. Honestly, it's like such an honour to be able to do this interview. Like, I'm thrilled. I've been sitting on this since March. It's How? Like, How did you keep this inside you? It's destroyed me. Like, it has absolutely destroyed me. <laughs> it has felt like a dream. It's felt like a nightmare. It kind of felt like it w- wasn't real. And then, like, I'm slowly beginning to, like, cognitively relive it again, like, by watching the show. And, you know, and I, yeah, just to be able to finally talk about it and be able to kind of, I don't know, like, emotionally process it. Like, it's taken me so long to be able to do that. Because it's just, it's been a whirlwind. Like, this whole experience is a mixture of, like, a personal experience of, like, a life-changing kind of celebrity school camp. And having to make a TV show. And you always find the juxtaposition of those two things. So like having won it, it was like, woohoo. And then it was like, okay, pickups. We need to do pickups. And we need to wrap because the crew's like needs to go home. And it was suddenly like, like lights out. And it all gets packed up. And you just go like, oh, that's right. You know, so. And did that even happen? There's, I guess the thing that like buzzes me out is, is just imagining coming back. And, you know, there are a few outwardly lower stake shows than Celebrity Treasure <laughs> Island in some respects. Obviously, the, the charitable stuff is there, but it, it's but that's almost the point of it compared to like the Married at First Sights of this world. And yet something happened on that show and you can't give away any of it, really. Like you just have to carry it around with you. Like, I don't know. I don't understand. <laughs> also, can I just say, because we have been, uh, we chat quite often, you and I. Yeah. <laughs> and... <laughs> I had no clue. Like, yes. not only do we chat quite often, you came on an Insta Live for the Real Pod, and you chatted with me and Alex for like a good hour about all things Celebrity Treasure Island, and I was watching you like a hawk in every <laughs> conversation. And you, some would were, say, I played the biggest blind side of all. You did, you, you, <laughs> which you was were me vacuum. and the New Zealand media. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've been. Um, I feel hyper visible. Um, I didn't think I was going to last as long as I did and everyone says that but I literally had gigs like (laughs) four days after Celebrity Treasure Island I had to host the Axis Awards which is like (laughs) the biggest media awards in Auckland there's like thousands of coked up media execs and I had just come back from Celebrity Treasure Island and I couldn't tell anyone I couldn't look at my phone I couldn't look at my phone I went to my agent's office I had a breakdown I said I don't know what to do Imogen who's amazing this is my agent she goes like I've never seen you like this. You seem broken. <laughs> did, did she know? Like, does I, any... I told my agent, yeah, because yeah. I was like, I need help because I couldn't process what was going on. And then I couldn't, because I couldn't look at my phone. <laughs> she had to print off all my emails for me on paper so that I could read them like a book. Because I just... <laughs> old school executive. Because what it. it was, like, it wasn't, I mean, obviously it's not, it, it, wasn't a t- it was an intense experience. It was massive. It was a lot of time away but more than that, it was like a lot of time invested in something. It yeah. was like the greatest improv of my life where you didn't drop character. Like you just stayed in it. And it wasn't until basically I got home to the Airbnb, I stood in the shower and like literally like just broke down. Like I was just because I would finally like dropped in a way because I'd been on the whole time. <laughs> that is and that's really and I watched, intense. I watched myself back and I'm like, holy moly, that guy is... <laughs> That is the face of someone who's invested, invested. And the crazy thing is, and I think of someone like Casey Frank, who you might not remember from the show because he went out first. But when you're going into this, you have no idea how long you're going to be there. No. And if you've convinced yourself, I'm not going to be here very long over the Access Awards, I've got some shows to do, and I'll have plenty of time to prep for that because I'm going to get booted off in the first few weeks or the first few days even. Um, if that is some kind of crazy social experiment mind game that you're in, you know? The whole thing is. The whole thing is. Yeah, it's um oh I, I it's so hard to kind of pull it apart, like the, the impact. And everyone keeps asking like how has it changed you as a person? You know, I really just don't know how to like singly put my finger on like the thing that has changed in me. But it's like it's just evolved for me, like in every aspect. So, I mean, because it does. Watching the show, it felt like it changed you. And I, you know, I think there was you spoke so poignantly on it about 
you know, the the reason that I think you it's hard hard thing to to figure out, but it felt like you were doing it for your charity. Like your charity was carrying you through, particularly the finale, which somehow was you had the worst ever. <laughs> But winning performance yeah. <laughs> of all time, honestly. But, was, um, yeah. So, but you know, so so you you there was it was like this whole thing on some level felt like it was a performance that existed for fourteen year old Chris and fourteen year old Chris's all around the country to 100%. say it gets better and you'll get through it and you're you're more than you know. Uh, like the impact is crazy and like I think like the final is such an interesting one to look at because. Like I need, like as much as I'm like I'm not a good runner I'm not a good like I don't have a good aim and like I'd kind of joke about it and everyone's like yeah you do you're smoking it look how good you are at swimming like at the end of the day like I actually like wasn't good you know like I am not good that's fine it's not I'm I'm not a athlete I'm, I'm a comedian pushing. I don't practice that and the thing I guess like I that reve- like was revealed to me in that final was like the only the thing I am not the only but the thing I am really good at is like not giving up. And I think like that is the key takeaway here. And that's the thing that I'm like so excited about like sharing with the audience is like, especially the kids is like, it's like just to have like proof to be like, it can turn around. Like you just have to keep like persevering. And like, cause if you surrender at any point, like if I surrendered at any point in that final, it would have been over, you know? And so I was just like chasing it so hard and I like I knew like after the slingshot that I had lost, you know, in many ways. But if I'd arrived, like if I had got lost in the bushes and started hamming it up for the audience because I was like, I'm too cool for this, then it would have been over and it would have sucked and it would have been disrespectful to everyone who had been on that show. It would have been disrespectful to the audience who had watched and invested in me and I knew I was doing that. So I was like, I just have to like persevere in some way. And actually at that point, all I wanted to be was like there <laughs> when Lance and Edna digged up the treasure. I just wanted to be in the back of the shot. That's all I wanted. And I remember being like, I'm an idiot. Like when I was lost in the bushes, like I'm a fool because I was just trying to catch up the whole time. How long did that whole process all take? All day. All day. Wow. All day. And I had been like so smugly being like, there's no challenge on Celebrity Treasure Island. It's like, just run a kilometer. And then it was like, beauty, the first challenge, like sling a, some t- like do it like slingshot and then run a kilometer. And it like killed us. Like, cause we had nothing in us. We were so hung. Like we had a bit of food in the um, garlic bulb tent, but like not enough. Like we hadn't been training. We were all famished. And then we suddenly ran across that beach and like, you know, it almost killed Lance. But also... <laughs> okay, literally, we, we right? literally almost killed yeah. him. Okay, so if anyone, for a start, I'm weeping. <laughs> like, this is the first time I have <laughs> cried on this podcast, of which we've done, like, hundreds of episodes. So I don't... That, that's very emotional. Um, but running on sand... So hard. No <laughs> joke. Like, no joke. That's where the power of doing something bigger than yourself... like. This is, I guess, the things you learn. But the power of doing something bigger than yourself will pull you through because literally Chris Parker was like, fuck this. Like, fuck, this is too hard. What are they doing to us? Like, absolutely not. It is 28 degrees. I can't get a grip on the sand. This flag that I have to run to seems miles away. Like, because I could see how far I had to run because Lance and Edna were running ahead of me on the beach. Well, and, and also you ran so much further than everyone else by just going <laughs> to all the wrong places and just wandering through the bush yelling. I know. But I wrote on my hand, like, you know, was it like do it for Rainbow Youth or something? And it was just the thing that I would like look back at and just be like, okay, this is just more than you. Like you just have to put your ego aside and just like rise up to something beyond you. And it was it was the thing that just like stopped me from giving up, which is so corny, it's but not, so but real. We love, corny. We love corny love things, as you, as you well and truly know. But I have to say that I know you were doing this for, for Rainbow Youth and obviously you had your own, you know, journey in that. Um, but – you really made an impact far beyond your charity and the people that you were hoping to reach. And I'm so glad that you did have that impact on those people. But you should know that for people like me who just just 
Like I'm a Gumby idiot, and I'm not saying that you are, but I certainly am. No, but I identify like that too. <laughs> really, truly, like the Gumby so idiot I'm, community. The Gumby idiot community, of which there are. We are the few. ones who are so scared of cross country. Yes, like I, you know, I pulled every trick in the book to get out Same. of PE. Always very intimidated by anyone who could do anything remotely skillful physically. And like my, I feel like my only skill is being able to yabber on a bit, you know. And um, and so you have given me hope. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so. I mean, I don't know if it made the. Edit. I haven't seen the episode yet. Like we're what we're obviously recording this. Before. You've seen it, but I haven't. Yes. Um, but it was my weird knowledge of weeds that got oh, me through. I don't yeah. know if it's it, not in the edit. Okay. No, you're, no, it's it's where, where you said about the grass that grows at your house. The ku, the kaikuya. That's the same. Yes, mm, yeah, but I don't I don't think we get the the weeds of the weeds. Do you know what we I mean? We get the weeds of the weeds. You said I have this grass that grows at my house. It is like there's no way this has just happened recently. So like we all arrive in that spot, and Lance is. No, you make it sound like you all arrive at the same time. No, which is certainly not what <laughs> I was. Happened. Eleven minutes twenty two. That's how long I had to wait. We had no idea watching. Really? It seems like hours. It seemed like yeah. a really long Beautiful. time. Beautiful. Felt like the sun was setting. The magic of television. <laughs> so That's still a long time. Basically though. the yeah, way, like I mean, hours. this could be like huge spoilers, but I mean, obviously the you know, there's priorities for the show. So like the first priority is to film the TV show. They really like, but it make <laughs> it fair, but like otherwise it's ridiculous. So, you know, you, there are checkpoints along the way where they stop and repo and stuff and mm-hmm. it's all done by stopwatch. So you kind of always know you're three minutes 55 but behind. Right. You're six minutes 80 behind, <laughs> whatever, you know, 80. Uh, and so <laughs> I uh, I was standing, we got to the final point and my final checkpoint and it was like Lance got to run off and then Edna had to wait like two minutes, whatever. And then I had to wait 11 minutes, 22. <laughs> oh 11 God. minutes, 22. And I was standing on the beach, holding my spade, looking at the production coordinator, and she's like, you could still do it. <laughs> like, and she knew. She knew. And she's like, you could still do it. And she's kind of looking at me, just like kind of shaking her head. And she's like, and then she goes, it's a lucky number. And then she's like counting down, and I'm just going like, please, 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 Lance, I have not have found the treasure yet. And I get to run over. But because I ran in so fast, I just didn't get to get a lay of the land. Like, I just didn't know where I was. So I was like, in, like, open, like, go into the fastest escape room of my mind, just, like, furiously touching objects to find maps. And then um, thinking still that I needed 10 pieces of the map. Or I didn't know that you only needed three, and all that wheeling and dealing was for nothing. Nothing. But to because the clues, crazy. you could literally just walk in there and just start lifting things up. And Absolutely. you're going to find the three bits Absolutely, you yeah. So... I was like, you know, just furiously touching stuff. And then I got my three pieces of the map and it all kind of cohesively went together. And then, but you have no sense of this map, like how big the distance is. It could be we amazing. never got a look at the map as viewers. I've got it here. What? I know how much you guys love this stuff. Oh, so, this is absolutely just mind blowing. So here are the pieces. They're nothing. They're little here bits the of pieces. fabric. And my blood is on this. This is insane. And so we had to kind of put these together. Um... You know, and so you just look at that and you're like, I have no idea. I don't yeah, even know no where. There's no scale on it. There's I don't no know where orientation I am. on it. No. And so I, I ran way too far and then I had to run back. And then luckily when I'm back in time, it, Lance has dug up the entire <laughs> thing. He's dug it all up. It's, there's just soil everywhere. And Edna's kind of there. And I see them still digging. And I'm like, we always talk about like, there's always a chance to catch up in this game. Yeah. And I was like, once we reached the soil and everyone's digging, everything else didn't matter. Like, it didn't matter how far no. behind I was because now it's an even race. So I would argue it's a potentially clever, very clever planning by production to make it so that the yes. last thing you have to do is... It's almost also almost not an even race because they're fresh out of ideas and they're gassed. Yeah, but he's gassed from running. Yeah, yeah but I feel like coming with fresh eyes Northland. and the adrenaline of I'm, I'm still in this is like almost a weird... We a all dug for and a, you so know, long. A knowledge of weeds how long? also. We dug for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Like I felt like we were renovating <laughs> the garden. Like, And I was like, I I just was like dealing with this kaikuya. And I was like, it, it, I just keep saying to myself, it can't be under this. It just no. yeah. cannot be under this. I dealt with this in my garden. It's like rope that just soils right through the soil and it can survive. And like, I think we imported it here in New Zealand, like the sixties. It's like an African, like grass, like wild grass. It can survive the desert. I was like, it's in this like beautiful, rich soil. It's 
everywhere. So I just started pulling at the weeds to see where there weren't weeds. Or where they weren't, atta- like, weren't, weren't, weren't attached, attached into the ground. So they, w- they would have spread some out over. Well, everywhere everyone else was digging, they were just buried in because it was like you, your spade would go through it. Did, right. did they show me breaking my spade? No. no. Oh, my God. So I literally get my spade. I'm like, right, like still having it up for TV. Let's get digging. And I jump on my spade and my sn- spade snaps in half. So I'm digging with this like terrible spade and like then I get a new one like while everyone else is still digging. And then, yeah, I just still remember like heading towards the tree and thinking like, I reckon this is it. And then you feel the cameras, like there's like 13 cameras or whatever, all just go shoop, on you. <laughs> and then my spade just going right through that soil like a butter. And like, yeah, and then it's just like so overwhelming because the, imp- the thought of like, you're just like $100,000 for Amy Youth. It's all you're thinking is like $100,000 for Amy Youth. And you just think about them like Monday to Friday, like trying to keep that charity going and just like the day to day, like struggles of that charity and just like uh, you just keep going like a hundred thousand that's all I could think so it's a really meaningful amount of money for a small car- oh. it's, mm. it's not like they're the you know like so, some giant you know transnational cha- uh, charity this is like here it's like here and it's like grassroots and it's like helping kids just like right on the doorstep in, in their homes like making a difference it change lives a hundred percent like and learning from them that like you know, like we're in a pandemic, it's, it affects everyone and like specifically charitable organisations, the money needs to go mm. to like the response, like the, the pandemic response. So we can't always like open our wallets for these other really important charities. So especially this time of year, apparently, is so hard for all these charities. So yeah, I mean, ama- like amazing, just amazing. It's like a relief, I guess. They don't know yet. They don't know. They don't know. They will find wow. it when they watch the show. That is so cool. It's crazy. Oh, that's amazing. The be- the most beautiful thing, you know, aside from that, though, in that final moment is the fact that you hit it and there's no sense, you know, like the way that Lance and Edna kind of cluster around you and they seem to feel it as, as deeply as you do. Like, can you talk a bit about your those relationships, like, subsequent to the show? Like, you and Lance seem bonded for life in this very intense way. Did, did it transcend the show or is it this thing where you kind of come out and you're like, oh, bye. You know, like, well, how does that all work? We still catch up like all the time. Like, um, he, <laughs> I mean, I think he did a bit of like traveling afterwards, like uh, while we had freedom. And But now that he's back, you know, we've, we've had a few like distance walks and we message a lot. Um, I think, you know, there's like, I just have a really like funny relationship with men like I always have like I've always felt like um intimidated by them or like I'm not part of the group so when I do come across a man like Lance who is like just sees me allows me to be like me um and like just can like buoy me up and like blow me up and just make me feel dynamite like I just like I know how good he is, you know, just like, I'm like, there is like, that is like a, just a, that's a pure light. Like he's, he's the best. Like he's just so loyal, so compassionate, so caring. Like, and it must be, I think being in that dance community, like, of course he's around gay guys all the time. Like so many iconic, like trans performers as well. So he's not like uncomfortable in this world. And so he's such a, I mean, I don't need an ally, but like he's such an ally for the community. Um, yeah, and Edna is like just the one who should have won in my mind. Like she, and in that sense, like where your spade hits is just chance. Yeah. I feel like we all won by just getting to the final because that was the hardest thing. Totally. It felt like you all came away winners as, as a viewer. And also Edna, I think, um, had the most stacked against her in terms of how much um, she faced, how much opposition she faced throughout, how much negativity she faced from other people. And she just stood firm all the way through. And it's like, it's just like so fierce and strong and honest and like just so inspiring. Like I think she probably had the biggest impact on everyone on the show because a lot of the women are like, just got to be more like Edna. You know, like Mm, you'd hear like Bryn talk about that and Kim talk about it. And I was exactly the same. Just like, you've got to like deal with conflict the way that Edna deals with it, which is like, get it out in front of people and then like, and solve it fast. Like she Mm. doesn't, 
fester on stuff. She mm. just kind of moves beyond it. Mm. Um, she's so, yeah, she's so incredible. I'm so glad like we got to see all of her because I think it's really important for New Zealanders to see women like that yeah. and what they are actually capable of rather than just like putting them in a box as like a influencer, which she's not. She's like a businesswoman, you know? Yeah. The whole thing, the whole, the whole casting of the show, we were just reflecting on it before you, you started. Like it felt like we got this much more sort of diverse and textured and interesting vision of New Zealand and New Zealanders than than I can recall seeing on screens in a long time. Like, were you were you conscious when you were making it that this was like a, you know, that whatever Celebrity Treasure Island has been or whatever these kinds of shows are, this was different? Yeah, 100% because of the... Like the where, where the net was cast was so much wider than it has been in the past, and um, but I I got an inkling of that in the first re, like the first season the remount with Sam I was like I felt like when you got to hear the celebrities talk about their charities I was like wow there's something like quite powerful in this reboot um, and it's still kind of finding itself and then I felt like this season they just gave it space and allowed the kind of chaos and conflict to happen and what the conversations that would arise out of that ageism you know sexism or like underestimating women or lots of sort of stuff that like the pressure that women have in these sort of areas queer politics race like it all kind of boiled up and um i feel like yeah that's the power of this the, the it was it was special like i i knew it when i was there and i've been on like a few sets like because i work in this industry and you know you're like it's just another day at work where i was i was like this is gonna be great we have watched a lot of local <laughs> too much. reality Far too much reality television <laughs> i'm embarrassed <laughs> so 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 much under the guise of our jobs and I have never been so impacted by a show well a reality show like this and I know we kind of we say that at the end of every season of a show that we really enjoy but I mean it this time well no I think that you know like the the Apprentice Aotearoa had little elements of that for sure and was just a very entertaining and well-made product this is a category difference yeah. because it had these sort of you know just all of this big emotional, some of the, you know, the big conversations and that that you you were just referring to that, that this country is sort of having in this sort of unstructured way at the moment, and even even seeing Buck Shelford who opens the show just as this taciturn guy who seems like he's just got on the wrong bus kind of thing, and by the end he's talking about the rainbow community and his whanau, and then you're like. That's an all black captain. That's something that all of this kind of middle New Zealand, quote unquote, sort of sees. And if they can see him be embracing that community, maybe they can sort of let go of a bit of their stuff as well. Because this is prime time. And I think that's the thing that's not lost on me now. Like, I, I exist in the echo chamber. I know the echo chamber well. And I'm tired of the echo chamber because it feels like you're never going to make any progress. Whereas to hit in the mainstream in this way and it's it can be clunky but I'm like the power of it like that's where we make the change and I've always thought that like even like writing for Jono and Ben I was like little do these little shits know like the audience <laughs> that it's like two gay men who are writing this series now like it's that's where we can begin to have that influence and hopefully we can just keep moving forward with it in this space now that people trust it you know and if I uh, I'm so glad like New Zealand has got on board with the series and like embraced it in a way that there's like kind of been no cultural pop cultural cr cringe with it. God no. And it's rated its ass off. Yeah. Like 290,000 an episode on linear alone. Like this is it's a big monster. number. It's huge. And I put that down to the cast. I I'm so proud of us all 21 of us as a cast because it involves like you are the scriptwriter, you are the director of your own story every day, and it's up to you to throw yourself in there, create story, open yourself up, be vulnerable, be funny, like do whatever. You've got the power. Like if you want a quiet day on set, then you could just sulk, hide in the back, whatever. But if you want to create TV, then you throw yourself in there, and everyone did. Like everyone did. Everyone was willing to do that, um, and so holy, like it made such great TV. It was such a superbly cast show. I mean, we, in, you know, in terms of the finale, the three of you, I was so happy for any one of you to win, which I feel like I've never been in that situation before because I knew you all supported each other as well, that no one was going to be left disappointed. 
when you speak of your friendship with Lance, and um, it, it, it reminds me of my friendship with Alex, that's what makes me think of, is that like, Alex is my Lance or my Chris, I'm not sure who I am in that, <laughs> in that dynamic. But you know, when we first met, I was just an old lady and she was just a young thing and we shouldn't have gotten on, but we do and it's just, she's so special to me. Anyway. I'm Buck. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, we have, um, we're out of time and you you are going to be having an extremely busy night and day tomorrow. And Far out. Don't forget us. Please don't forget us. Thank you. F- for the hat. <laughs> Chris has gifted the museum. The iconic hat. The iconic. Here's why. Because, and this is like one final thing. So it's, we, be- we, it's the peach hat with the, with the flaps. The flap hat, yeah. Because, like, there has been no drop of cynicism in this podcast and this community like and I think we are so cynical as a country often like it's where our comedy kind of lies a little bit cynicism and like it is so brave to be earnest (laughs) and sincere I like live in that kind of space all the time and so like yeah I just wanted to be like see that reflect it back you can have that Um, and I just want to be like thank you guys so much for the power rankings, the podcast, the fandom, like it's it's so important because it, it means we can just keep moving forward like as well. It's not really about like us being feeling famous. It's more about, I care more about like our ecosystem, our arts ecosystem, like th- that is thriving and that we have like shows that we're proud of and that we keep watching. Beautiful. It's beautiful. One last thought. When we get to level 3.2 and can have 25 person barbecues from different um, yes. different bubbles, that's that's 24 contestants. Oh, yeah. And three members of the RealPod team and one producer, right? Perfect. I and mean, that's 25. That's all I'm saying. I just pointed it out there. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming Thanks, in. Guys. You're amazing. Congratulations. Such an earnest pod. I'm clearly in my earnest space right now. That's okay. We need that's all that. We, do, we yeah. love it. We're a very, very serious, earnest <laughs> podcast, as you know. No, thank we're, you. we're very comfortable being here, yeah. Th- yeah. Thank you for sharing and thank you for being vulnerable and opening up to us. Thank all your castmates when you next see them. And thank you, TI, here for recording. Thank you to Nando's for sponsoring this podcast. And uh, thanks, Dunk. Thanks, Dunk, for going on the journey with me. Thanks, Uncle Buck. Let's close the chest for good. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spin-Off. You can help us keep all of The Spin-Off's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Kia ora, this is Toby Manhire, here to urge you to tune in to Gone by Lunchtime, a podcast with me, Annabelle Lee Mather and Ben Thomas, tackling the world of New Zealand politics, from policy to polling, from scandal to psychodrama. Listen to Gone by Lunchtime, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, wherever good pods are sold. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.